Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Pretty well? Great. Well, it is great to be with you this morning. My name is Justin. I'm the pastor here at Aletheia. And we are nearing the end of our series in the book of Daniel. And this morning, we are going to be in Daniel chapter 9, which is honestly, a, it's a fascinating chapter and incredibly, incredibly helpful. And what we have in it is a man who is longing for the end of his exile. And I don't know about you, but I've experienced the feeling of longing a lot lately. This past week was just a week in which I wanted the end of COVID. (laughs) I was longing for the end of every activity, having these layers of complexity that you have to work through and figure out. Is this place open? Are they doing, you know, dine in or just take out? How far do I, just the layers of complexity are intense. And I found myself this week just longing for it to be done. And I'm sure there are many, many stories represented in this room, whether it's on a personal nature or whether it's about something nationally or globally that you are just longing to come to an end. You know, our parents who are watching upstairs, you are longing for the end of COVID so that Aletheia kids can be in full swing and you don't have to be, you know, exiled to the foyer upstairs. There are so many things that we're longing for and the beautiful timeliness of Daniel chapter 9 is showing us a man who is longing in a really healthy and emotionally stable and hopeful yet honest way. So we're going to be In Daniel chapter 9, you can go ahead and open there. We're going to read some select verses. We're going to read like the first third. We're going to skip the second third, and we're going to read the final third. So follow along in your Bible or a Bible app. On the app, if you click on Sunday at Aletheia, you'll find today's Bible passage, and you can find it there too. You're also welcome to follow along up here on the screen. So I'm going to read. We're going to pray. We're going to let Daniel help us know what it looks like to long for the end of exile. Verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame, as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, in all the lands to which you have driven them, because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, Belongs open shame to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Jump down to verse 16. O Lord, according to your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy hill. Because because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, O our God... Listen to our prayer, excuse me, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, 
and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in the prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for, for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and, and to rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and a moat, but in a troubled time. And after the sixty-two weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray and ask that he would guide us in it today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this timely chapter in your scriptures. Lord, as Daniel longs for the end of exile, Lord, there's so much that we are longing for, both personally, nationally, and in our age, in the age in which we live. Lord, our prayer is that you would shape our longing through these scriptures, and that you would lead and guide us by your Spirit as you have promised to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So as I said, in Daniel 9, we have a man who is longing for the end of exile. And he longs in a way that's healthy, and that's Godward, and that actually helps his own soul. And he's processing it with God. Now, when I was thinking of people processing longing emotions, it made me think of songwriters, you know, song that so many times they're processing out loud, and that's what comes in the form of a song. Now, there are some songs, I, I don't know if you've experienced this, but I re recognize this a lot in the songs that I l listen to. There are ways to process emotions that seem to lead to an unhelpful <laughs> arrival point. That you listen to this music and the melancholy just depresses you. <laughs> but then there's some songs that are so triumphant that they seem to deny that life is hard. Two examples. And as a disclaimer, I love both these songs, okay? I love them. Now, they're from the 1970s. So if you've never heard them, don't worry about it. Ask your, ask your grandparents about them and they can tell you about these songs. This is um, the first line from Joni Mitchell's A Case of You. And Joni Mitchell is just like the melancholy. Just It's soaked in melancholy. But she says this, Just before our love got lost, you said... I'm as constant as a northern star. And I said, constantly in the darkness. Where's that at? If you want me, I'll be in the bar. That song just leaves you in a place of sadness and despair, though I love it. And I'm going to go after church and listen to that song multiple times because it's super enjoyable. But it's almost as if there's a bit too much exile in it, not enough hope. But then you have this song. This is James Taylor's uh, Secret O Life. And if you're wondering, like, why do you listen to such old music? Okay, th these are just two examples. Give me a break, okay? I listen to music from all different decades, but these are my favorite. Okay, James Taylor's Secret O Life says this. The secret of life is enjoying the passage of time. There ain't nothing to it. Any fool can do it. Really? James? The secret of life is enjoying the passage of time? Anybody else ever had passages of time in your life that if you called them enjoyable, it would be a lie? You see, this has a bit too little exile in it for me. 
What Daniel does in the way that he processes his longing for the end of exile, he doesn't let his longing lead him to despair, nor does he act triumphant and ignore his plight. I mean, he's, he's probably between 85 and 90 year, years old. He's sitting in Babylon. He's been in exile for 70 years. He doesn't ignore that difficulty. His emotion is palpable. He is longing for the end of exile. But the way in which he longs leads him to a place that's neither despair nor dishonesty, but it's hopeful longing, realistic, truthful, and yet hopeful. And I think if we see what he's doing, we can long for the end of our exilic experiences and our exilic moment in a healthy way. So there are three things that he does in the way that he longs. And we must do these things when we long, that he longs godwardly, and so must we. So we, we must long godwardly, not a real word, I get it. All the type A people are like, not a word, yes, I recognize it, okay, I'll explain it. We must long godwardly, we must long honestly, and we must long openly. Godwardly, honestly, openly. So, get the picture. He's sitting, he's reading the writings of the prophet Jeremiah, and he's reading about the end of exile. He's reading about God's promise to bring this exile to an end, and he's longing for it. He's homesick. He's tired of exile. So what does he do? In verse 3, Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking Him by prayer. What we must do in order to long healthily and with hope is in our longing we must turn Godwardly. I know I made the word up, but it gets the point across. We must turn to God. Now, I know that nothing could seem more normal and expected than a pastor to tell you that prayer is important. (laughs) But let me explain to you why. You see, my infantile understanding of prayer when I was a kid was, I need stuff, I ask God for stuff, God gives me stuff. There was my synopsis (laughs) of prayer as a kid. However, what we see in the scriptures is that prayer has... A far more profound and and multifaceted function in the life of somebody who seeks God through prayer. And one of the things it does is it helps us process through difficult emotions. In Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says to to these Philippian Jesus followers, he says, When you're anxious, pray. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells his followers, he says, When people persecute you, Pray for them. In Psalm 13, the opening lines show us that this person feels like God has forgotten them. The words are literally, O Lord, why have you forgotten me? Now notice what the psalmist is doing. The psalmist is not turning away from God. He's turning toward God to process his difficult emotions. And this is one of the incredible gifts of prayer. Is that when we, in our longing, take our longing to God... And process our longing with God. It does something profound to us. Prayer is not simply about getting God to do stuff for us. It's about God shaping and helping us in our very souls and spirits. So we must process with God. And when we long, we long Godwardly. But we also recognize, he says, I was seeking him by prayer and please... So it's not only asking God for stuff, but let's get something straight. Daniel is asking God for the end of exile. You see, he's sitting reading the prophet Jeremiah, and God, through the prophet Jeremiah, has said, exile will come to an end, you will return home. And what does he do? He turns to God and said, God, you said that we're going to return home. Bring exile to an end. This is profound. Because God, God, God has promised it, and therefore, God's promise becomes the basis for Daniel's request of God. Now, this is so important because multiple times throughout this passage, Daniel is asking God for stuff, but it's always based in his word and his character. He's not asking God for random stuff, though I'm sure you know, God invites us to ask him to meet our needs and to you know, 
provide for us, but he's asking God to do things that he's already promised to do. He also bases his pleas in God's character. Look at verse 4. He says, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. You see what he's doing? He's, He's speaking God's stated character back to God. He's saying, God, you've said that you are a covenant-keeping God. How does he know this? Oh, because he's read Deuteronomy 7 verse 9, which says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who, notice these words, keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Daniel is simply taking what he knows to be true of God's character and of God's promises And he's taking them to God and saying, God, this is who you are, and this is what you've said that you will do. Please. Please. See, we must make sure that when we long, that we're longing Godwardly, in order that our requests might be on the right basis as well. If we're grounding our requests in something else, we might be longing for the wrong thing and against the wrong thing. Like, if for you, exile equals when the, par- when the political party you don't like is in power, that's the wrong basis for longing. And then you'll ask God to kick those people out so, you're, so the party of your preference can get into power. Wrong understanding of exile. Wrong understanding of return from exile. What we must do is base our pleas in God's word. And what he said he will do and what he said he is like. Now, should we pray for political change and should, and should we pray for political outcomes that we want to see happen for the good of our city and for the good of our nation? Absolutely. But always shaped at their core by what God has said in his word about who he is and what he purposes to do in the world. Also notice, so... So, so as Daniel longs Godwardly, he's basing his pleas on God's promises, on his character, but also on his mercy. He, he, he says this in verse um, 18. He says, I do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. The beautiful thing about praying Godwardly and remembering God's promises is that you don't Ask him out of entitlement because you remember, oh, we don't deserve any of this. We don't deserve to return from exile. So you ask on the basis of his mercy. And this brings us to point number two, which is we must long honestly. We must long godwardly and we must long honestly. Now, when I say honestly, I don't simply mean like raw honesty about our emotions, though the, 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 the biblical text certainly has examples of people bringing their raw emotions to God, absolutely. But I mean, honestly, in terms of the reason for exile itself, what, what does Daniel do in terms of asking his request of God? Well, he, he summarizes it here in verse, tw- in verse 20. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord God... So what is he doing? When he's asking God for the end of exile, he's confessing. He's confessing his sin and the sin of his forefathers. He remembers the reason for exile is justified. And the reason for exile is sin. And he calls himself a sinner and he owns his own part to play in the reason for exile. This is why no human being ever has the basis to ask God out of an entitled attitude because we don't deserve anything. What we deserve is eternal exile because of our sin. You might say, wow, that's, that's intense. Yes, but when our first parents betrayed God and turned their back on Him and God sent them out of the garden, that destiny is what every human being that ever came from those people have deserved. And Daniel recognizes this. This This is so important. What what he doesn't do is he doesn't differentiate too far 
from the leaders who were the quote-unquote cause of exile in the first place. So, so notice this. He says in verse, uh, in verse 7 and 8, he says, Now we've gone into exile because of the treachery they have committed, referring to the princes and the leaders and the wicked Judean kings who ruled before he was even born. But then he said, And we have sinned. Note, notice his understanding of corporate responsibility and corporate guilt. He doesn't say, they sinned, we are in exile because they sinned. I, I had no part in that, therefore end my exile because I don't deserve what th- they caused. And if we're honest, in the West, this is what we want to do. We want to differentiate as far away as we can from the cause and say, it's their fault. And no, I'm not part of that. You know, they're, they're like a 2 out of 10 on the, mo- on the moral scale. And I'm like an 8 out of 10. Don't lump me in with them, okay? Daniel doesn't do that at any point. He says, look, Lord, exile is because of sin. I might not be Nebuchadnezzar and a Judean king, like, you know, like one of the wicked ones from the book of Kings, but I am a sinner. Exile. I have a hand in the cause of exile. When we long honestly... We own the truth from the scriptures that we have a part to play in the wreckage of our world. We don't like to do this in the West. I recognize that. We want to differentiate. We want to distance ourselves. But that's not how you long properly. If you don't own that reality that because you're a sinner, you're part of the problem, what we will do is we will go to God with an entitled attitude and say, God... I don't deserve this. This is because of them. Them. But that's not how Daniel longs, nor nor is it true, biblically speaking. But if we want to long with hope, we need to long honestly. And we long honestly when when we confess our sins. And we say, God, I recognize I don't deserve to be delivered from anything, never mind my situation, never mind a pandemic. You know, I, I have no basis for demanding that you do X, Y, and Z in my life, but I'm pleading, you know, I'm pleading with you for your mercy. This is how we long for the end of exile well. And I think only once we've dispatched with the entitlement And I think only once we've longed godwardly on the basis of his character and his promises and his word, and only once we're honest that we are sinners who need his salvation and his mercy, are we then postured correctly to do the third thing, which might be the hardest, which is to long openly. We must long openly. Notice, while he's praying, Gabriel the angelic messenger is sent to him. And he tells him, like he, he tells him the answer to his prayer. Daniel asks, when is exile going to end? He gets his answer. Verse 24 says, 70 weeks, and that's literally 70 sevens, are decreed about your people. Gabriel just told Daniel, it's not going to be 70 years, it's going to be 70 times 7. How bummed would you be? If you were Daniel, you're 85, 90 years old, and you're, you're kind of coming up on the end of the 70 years. You, you think it's all that you're going to return with your people to your homeland, that exile is going to be over, and Israel is going to be restored, and it's going to be its former glory again. And God tells you, nope, it's going to be longer. Now, some commentators, you know, they point out the fact that this could mean it's 490 years, literally, and they like work out the timeline as to how that works. Others say it, it's kind of the way in which Jesus used seven times 70 when Peter asked, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? He said, no, 70 times seven. Like, it's going to be much longer and greater than you expect. But either way, the answer that Daniel gets is that it's going to be different from what you expected. But... It's going to be far more thorough 
than you ever imagined. Notice what follows after that verse. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city, and then look at what God plans to do, to finish the transgression, to finish it, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity. What is the cause of exile? Sin, iniquity. God has a plan to go to the very root of the problem, not just to put a band-aid over it, not just to you know, send them back and hopefully they've learned their lesson and then hope for the best and see what happens. No, God is going to thoroughly uproot the very core problem of exile to bring in everlasting righteousness. This made me think of um, like an issue I'm having at my own house at the moment. My kids have wreaked havoc on my baseboards, whether it's through rocking chairs or toys, the paint is just suffering greatly at their hands, and it's all chipped. So you have these, you know, this white baseboard and this part where the paint is just stripped off, and it's, it's a mess. If I were a good painter, here's what I would do. I would strip off all the paint, sand it down, prime it, and paint it properly. That's not what I did. <laughs> I went and I got some, you know, some wall putty and I, and I put it over and got some unmatching paint and I was like, good enough, okay? The good news is that God is far more thorough than we are. And God intends to go to the very root of the issue, to uproot iniquity, to uproot sin, and to deal with the cause of exile in the first place. When we long openly... We might get an answer to our question that says, God is working this way out in a fashion that's far more complicated than you expected, but that's far more thorough than you ever imagined. And we might not understand his methodology. The scriptures say his ways are above our ways, his thoughts are above our thoughts. And if you've been following Jesus for any amount of time, sometimes he does some stuff that makes you want to scratch your head. Be like, why that? Why that timeline? Why that way? But what we have here is the promise that God in His purposes and in His plan is far more thorough in what He's doing in your life and what He's doing in our world and in our age. And that is really, really good news. Because I don't want exile to end temporarily. I don't know about you, but I want a transformed world in where in which injustice is completely uprooted, in which violence is completely done away with. And God says, I'm going to do it, but it's going to be different than you expected. And the timeline is going to be different maybe from what you hoped, but I will do it. I will. How do we know is the question. How do you know that you can trust God when He does something with the timeline in your life personally that makes you want to scratch your head. And if you're honest, you do not like that timeline. You do not like the way he moved those chess pieces around in your life. I believe the way you can know that you can trust him is seen right here when it says in verse 26 that after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. I'm not sure if you noticed that verse. But God says, look, what I'm doing to end the exile is going to involve an anointed one who's going to be cut off. And because we have the rest of the scriptures, we know who that's referring to. And it's referring to Jesus Christ. What we have in the person of Jesus Christ is the down payment of God's promise to bring in an everlasting righteousness. When when Jesus Christ came into the world, when, when you look at his life, It profoundly impacts the way that you long for exile. First, because it helps you see that Jesus longs and yearns with you. When Jesus came into the world, he didn't look at the state of our age with with kind of aloofness or with distance. He was angry about it. He was sad about it. When his friend Mary whose brother Lazarus had died, and she comes to Jesus and says, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. What does Jesus do? He weeps with her. 
When Jesus is doubled over in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is about to go to the cross and to be cut off from the presence of his Father. He is about to be sent out of the city where he is going to be crucified. What is he doing? He's not standing like, like one of the ancient uh, Stoics and saying, it's fine, this is all going to pass, God has a plan. He's doubled over in agony, praying. When you see Jesus Christ, you see that your God and Savior yearns and longs with you. But that's not all. If all you had was the fact that Jesus empathizes with, with you in your pain, that would be only half the hope that, that you need. Jesus is the founder of what we see in verse 27 where it says, He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. This is... If you get this in your heart and soul, it will transform the way that you long and yearn for the end of exile in your own life. When you realize that Jesus Christ in coming and dying on the cross... That when, he, when, when his side was pierced and blood and water poured out, he told his disciples that his blood was cutting the new covenant. The strong covenant which brings in everlasting righteousness has already been cut by the blood of Christ when he died on the cross. The down payment of the transformed world that God promises you has been made. When you long for the end of your own personal exilic Moments when, when you long for the end of suffering and poverty and when you long for a better world, you know that you have a God who longs alongside you, but a God who has made the first installment of everlasting righteousness. I don't know where this lands for you. I, I don't know what's going on in your life, but if I can imagine in this moment, in our cultural moment and in a global pandemic and in circumstances that only you know about, there is probably some longing and some yearning in your life for the end of certain situations, for the tying up of certain loose ends, for the change of difficulties and of relational tensions. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure that you do. I believe when we see what this scripture points to, that God longs with us. And yet his promise is trustworthy and true. It will transform the way that we long. And it won't be dishonest, just saying, keep a brave face on, keep a smile on your face, everything is fine. It's not dishonest, nor does it send you into despair. It helps you to long with hope. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Oh Lord, what a timely scripture. For God, right now we, we are longing. We're longing for the end of a pandemic. We're longing for the end of the suffering of so many. We're longing for the end of complexities, and then all of the stories and the lives that are represented, there is longing and there is yearning. God, my prayer is that you would point our eyes and the affections of our heart toward our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who longs with us, yearns with us, weeps with us, and yet who is himself the atoning sacrifice who is cut off And the first installment of the everlasting righteousness that you have gifted to us and that you promised to bring into the entire world. God, we set our eyes on that hope that we might endure in our moment of longing. We love you. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.